We suspect strongly that you've seen the top in the S&P and the NASDAQ 100. Okay. Step one. Step two, we expected the drop we got. In fact, we called it fairly well. Yes. And we expected, we also expected a bounce point. And we got the bounce point. In fact, for the NASDAQ 100, it occurred exactly where we said it would happen. Michael Oliver, how are you? I'm fine. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing good. Doing Thank well? you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Okay. Uh, what's that saying? May you live in interesting times. Here we are. So yeah. let's talk about the overall broader market. You've had some great calls with that. We've had a big sell-off here. Then we bounced the last week. What are your thoughts on the overall broader market from here? <clears throat> We suspect strongly that you've seen the top in the S&P and the NASDAQ 100. Okay. Step one. Step two, we expected the drop we got. In fact, we called it fairly well. And yes. we expected, we also expected a bounce point. And we got the bounce point. And in fact, for the NASDAQ 100, it occurred exactly where we said it would happen, which is now most people won't understand this, but the three-quarter moving average of NASDAQ is similar to a 200-day, except it only changes once every quarter you adjust it. We thought we would drop down to that level, and that's 17,500, and that's where it stopped. Boom. Now we're 19,000. Okay. Everybody thinks it's party one because we all know that, uh, one, it was just a correction, right? Okay. But two, especially, it's by the Fed time because we know they're going to cut. They've said that. They're getting the inflation quote numbers that they wanted to see. Tomorrow, hopefully, we'll see another good one that makes them all happy. And so now they can shift to their other mandate, which is to say, concern about causing problems in the economy, which, of course, there's been some good data points on that that they only subtly admit, but, you know, they're there. we know they're there. Uh, anyway, so they're ready to shift. And, you know, whether they do it before September or not, meh, you know, being an Iron Man that he is, he probably doesn't want to do that because it would look like he's spooked by something. Uh I know what he's going to get spooked by, by the way, the banking sector, which is not having a good balance, by the way. But forgetting that, we have the rally right now, and let's assume tomorrow is a good data point. There'll probably be more rally. If you see that rally peter out in the stock market, like, you know, you get a good day tomorrow, then suddenly you close with a wobble, you know, maybe up but off the high, and then next week you've got nothing. If you see that kind of response, then effectively what the market's done is it's priced in the rate cut. Now, if you go back to the top in 2000, 2001, and the top in 2007, circle when the Fed shifted from policy prior rate increases and then a pause, and then they cut, circle the point where they cut. And if you shorted then, you did quite well. Okay. So the Fed cutting rates is not a good sign. Right. There's a party going on. Uh, now, at the same time, it's our view, fundamentally, and we're technicians, of course, but uh, gold is driven by monetary excess, which is an ongoing process, decade after decade. You know, the monies degrade because they increase the money supply, they cut rates below what the market might otherwise, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's just a constant fuel. So a rate cut shift now for gold is positive, and it's not a, a, a failing rally. Just like in 2001, if you shorted the S&P and bought T-bonds and gold, you made money both sides. 2007, if you shorted that Fed rate cut in September 2007, the market peaked a month later. Gold yep. T-bonds continued up while the yep. S&P went down. I think we're in the same position right now. I think you're right. I really do. So let's deep dive into that. You talked about this banking sector hasn't bounced and there's some trouble in that. Work that out a little bit more for me about um, the banking no, system. We, we measure all sectors, not just the S&P and the NASDAQ 100, which has been the leader index, of course, because why it's the heavily weighted tech stocks. And that's what this has all been about for the last couple of years. Okay. But uh, back last March of 2023, there was a crash in the banking sector, meaning it dropped over 30% in a matter of about four weeks, 34% in about four weeks. Now, it wasn't crash speed, but it was crash dimension. Market took that fairly well. Of course, the S&P was already well off its high at that point. It was trying mm -hmm. to bottom out. Uh, and so it didn't impact the market too much then. 
But we're now in a similar technical position by our metrics. And we did call that crash back then. In fact, in late January 2023, we said, watch out, there's an ambush coming in the banks. We didn't explain why or what bank or anything like that, but just we could see it in the technicals. Uh, we see it again now. Wow. Look at what happened to KBE, which is mm -hmm. the bank ETF. In the recent drop, you know, punch up on your price screen an S&P daily chart and punch up on your price screen a KBE chart daily. Go back to the recent peak. Look at the low, both made sharp lows, and look at the response you've had in KBE compared to the S&P. Feeble, groping. Just below the recent numbers in KBE, you don't want to go. We got down to 47, I think is the level. I think that's the number of 49 something now, if I'm not mistaken. About a point below that recent low, and we see hell could break loose, technically speaking. Wow. So that's a sector, again, that nobody's talking about it anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, but you, you better watch it because it's got the technicals to replicate what it did in March 2023. Yeah. You know. And usually how, correct me if I'm wrong, if how the banking sector goes, so goes the broader market, no? So goes the Fed. <laughs> right? Now, back then in March of 2023, they couldn't respond because they were just in the process of continuing yeah. to raise rates. So, you know, they couldn't reverse. Now they've gone to no, you know, like zero rate increases. And they've told us they're going to cut. And yeah. they're concerned about anything that might happen within the economy. And certainly if that bank sector starts to scream, and I'm arguing about two to three points below where you are right now, it starts to scream on KBE. Uh, that's where the headlines will suddenly shift outside of what tech is doing, what NVIDIA is doing, so forth. Got it. And that's when the S&P will suddenly realize that, oh, the rate cuts, <laughs> they're not so good. They're for reasons that aren't so good. Yep. So let's work out uh, the price of gold. You had a great call on gold. It was at... $2,500. Um, it's been bouncing up there, but it really hasn't broken out of, uh, out of that. What are your thoughts on gold moving into the uh, second half of the year here? It's, it's, we think the next, we turned aggressively bullish again on gold, not that we were ever bearish. We turned bullish in 2016. Your gold was 140. Our long-term view has never changed. There have been big sell-offs. We know that, but it's still a major trend. This pause that we've had since the April high in gold, when it got up to about twenty four fifty, you've you know you've eked out some marginally higher highs, but the the price chart is to keep risking that twenty five hundred level. Now again, we're talking the front month contracts, so we're talking October gold, which is you know below twenty five hundred. Everybody looks at DC gold, but October is the front traded contract. We'll rotate the December future in our analysis once we get into October, okay. the de delivery month. But that contract continues to be sold just short of twenty five hundred. Now, it actually isn't just a price level. We have momentum trigger levels that has served that the recent range action we've had in gold, which has been fairly benign, uh, will start to explode again if you get much above 2,500. I've got a whole cluster of momentum-based structures that are breaking out there, not just the price going to a new high. So it's for real. You get above 2,500, expect acceleration. And at that point in time, I'd expect the wild dog silver market to suddenly do just the opposite of what it's done recently. And, you know, we, if you look at silver since the beginning of the year, for example, gold peaked, well, it didn't peak. It stopped going up in mid-April. Mm -hmm. Look what silver did after mid-April. It shot up another 2 $3. So it's yeah. much stronger than gold after the April high, whereas gold plateaued. Now silver has recently been much weaker than gold. Mm -hmm. starting to show turning signs for us as well. And I think that once gold crosses that threshold to 2,500 and suddenly people realize it wasn't a top, uh, that's when the money flows start to get aggressive. And anybody who wanted to sell silver has probably already done it. They're either short or they're out. In which case, if you go back up, you're going to have a lot of short covering and you're going to have a lot of guys who got out saying, gosh, I made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And I think that the wild dog will slingshot again leading gold this time. What, well, by the way, watch the gold miners too. They're doing quite well. That's what I want to talk about. Yeah. Give me, yeah. A, give me an analysis on the miners and GDX. Yeah. GDX has, if you'll look at it, it's been zigzagging upward while gold plateaued. So yeah. it's a little bit to hide. It'll back off pretty seriously. 
Never go, our, our original re-entry level on, on GDX was back in March at 3150. We said at that point it's going to accelerate. Well, it shot up to 37, backed off 38. And the recent highs have been 39. Right now we're in the mid 37s, I think. Okay. Oh, great Coming call. Back up. Yeah. Now, I've got some renewed trigger levels on GDX that say probably acceleration, dramatic acceleration in the advance, no longer this arm wrestling stuff. If wow. you get up above 40 by just a bit, we get very specific in our reports, but it's just above 40. Now, the old high in GDX, again, the high back in 2020, mm -hmm. it's already you know 2070 in price, GDX was 46.50. Now, if you ever clear that, people are going to get excited. But I'm, I'm going to say this. If you get much above 40, you're going to clear that. And you're likely to clear it in a heartbeat and go zooming past it. In other words, I don't think it's resistance. I think we'll just go zipping through it. Why? The trigger level's just above the recent highs we've made. So just above 40. Got it. Got it. Okay. What uh, else should we be looking at? Again, we live in these interesting times. Is there anything else that's screaming at you right now, technically, yeah. that we should be aware of? There was the file back over the last year or two where T-bonds were tending to move with gold, meaning price, not yield, but price moved down with gold. If gold went down, price of T-bonds rally, if gold rally. Then they divorced themselves recently, and the T-bonds remained under pressure while gold shot up here since March. Because the T-bonds were capped off from they couldn't, they tried to go back to that October low of last year and couldn't do it, but they were capped off while gold broke out. So to some extent, the linkage that we saw got divorced, but now they're back in link again because the T-bonds via our work using quarterly momentum, mm -hmm. again, is measuring price versus, let's say, a three-quarter moving average. The oscillator broke through a massive basing action at the end of last month. Price wow. of T-bonds then were about 120 Right now, we're trading with 124, 25. We got up to 126. So I think the T-bonds have now shifted in a, in a mega way, indicating their next significant move is up, drop in yields. And it's coincident now with gold, inverse to what the stock market has just recently done. I was going to say that. It's very interesting because uh, the relationship with gold and them fits very well to the narrative of your narrative. That I, I agree with, stock market would sell off. People are looking for safety now. Mm -hmm. Big asset managers. 2022, it didn't work. T-bonds got clobbered with the they stock. They got clobbered, yeah. You know, 60, 40 portfolio was killed on both sides. Right. Now, we think the technicals are back in line as they were, interestingly, in 2001 through two when the bear market and stocks occurred, T-bonds went up and gold went up. Yeah. 2007 to 2009, stocks went down, T-bonds and gold went up. You yeah. make the same thing now. There's another market to watch, and it's a sleeper, and it's mm -hmm. a big foreign exchange, dollar index. Yeah, talk about that. Yeah, the dollar index has been a non-event for well over a year, ever since mm -hmm. it collapsed from that 115 high down into the 90s on dollar index itself, cash. And then it's oscillated in about a 7 8% range, trendless. And therefore, you know, who cares, right? It ha did, wasn't having an influence on any market. A month ago, we started to break some long-term metrics and just around the 104 level, just above 104. Now it's down in the 102 level. You close out a month at 102 or lower, and it's going to accelerate on the downside. So suddenly at that point, this other asset category, money, you know, the, the major currencies we're talking about now, because the dollar index is mostly the inverse of the euro and the yen, okay, combined. But you break that dollar index down about a half a point below where it's trading right now and close a month there or lower, any month in this quarter, this month or next month, expect the downside of the dollar to make some noise, in which case you have a new variable out there that affects will affect the other markets. So I'm agreeing with you, but usually... The thing is, it's set up so, it's almost too good to be set up like this. I want to mean too good for trading. But usually when you have a weaker dollar, you have stronger stocks. But the problem yeah, is, I it's know. not all set up. <laughs> no, it's technically, so I, no, I agree. And you look back and you can see what you just said. Yeah. So to, to some extent, it's, you know, it's a valid observation that, you know, that seems to be the way it works. Uh, but in this case, I, I argue, no, I think... Uh, 
it, it's, a, it's a benefactor to gold. It's not a real crucial one, by the way. You know, you go back and look at the dollar index trading at 102. Well, okay, go back to the December 2015 low in gold. Gold was $1,050. Okay. Now it's more than double. Okay. That same month, but the dollar index was trading about 97, 98. We're 102. So it's up 5%. Yeah. This many years. That hasn't adversely affected gold from rising. Right. Yeah. It helped it, but it's not hurt it. And now yeah. imagine the dollar gets into gear on the downside. Yeah. That's further help gold, you know. Yeah. It's it's just so interesting too, because again, it's it's so set up technically, but even fundamentally, it's set up what you just said, you know, and what your thesis is. So it'll be interesting um, to see to see that play out. Does this also go into the thesis? You had a great call in the yen carry trade. Does this also go into the yen carry trade ending or um, what are your thoughts on that? But well, I think that that event probably any any time you have an accident type event. And that was a mega accident you know, where a lot of bets are placed based upon a certain assumption of this rock being here and that rock being there and they don't move. Okay. If they start to move all of a sudden, any bets made on that stability, that assumption go awry and they go awry quickly, especially if they're leveraged. So you had yep. a lot of screaming events, probably in different markets as well, not just in the stock market like the Nikkei. But in other markets, affected us, where positions taken based on that, the yen carry, uh, were suddenly upended. But usually when you get a panic like that, it comes and goes pretty quickly. In other words, most of its emergency type damage is done fairly quickly, right. you know, with a week or so. And I, it look at this, the US stock market, it looks like it has, even the Nikkei has bounced a bit. So the fever of that event, I think, is passed. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Well, Michael, uh, you've had probably some of the best calls that uh, I have seen and been witness to. Um, I am recommending your service. I am a client. I do not get anything from this. And I say that with respect. This is because it's treated me very, very well. Um, so how do people find you? And I'll link to this uh, in the show notes. How do people find you if they want your services? Well, it's Oliver MSA for Momentum Structural Analysis. Visit the site. Uh, click on some of the buttons. So we, we discuss our method uh, and under a column I think called our value. You can scroll down and see a lot of archival reports. Uh, there's a short video there. There's an explanation of what is it that we do different? We don't look at price charts primarily. We look at something else. What is that? Why? Why? And we explain and and we we in our major reports, we cover all major asset categories because, frankly, in this day and age, you want to know what the major category, even if you're not in dollar, it has impact. If you're not in T-bonds, they have an impact. Oh, yeah. And don't just look at gold, don't just look at silver. There's impact. So anyway, that's that's our assessment and view. Excellent. So you don't know this, but I took a poll um, of viewers and it was overwhelmingly people wanted more Michael Oliver. <laughs> so congratulations to you. Again, I uh, will put everything in the show notes. Michael, it's always a pleasure having you on. You're always not only so informative, but you're always so gracious. I just email you and reach. You're so reachable. Yeah, let's go, Andy. Let's interview. So I want to thank you for that. Thank it's you. It's going to so be an much. interesting few months, Andy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.